Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Lovely to see you guys. Really awesome to be here. Um, what's up to all y'all here in the room? Also, shout out to Neely. To, apparently, I'm talking to you guys as well. So congratulations, and you're welcome. Uh, it is fun to be here. I come from Oregon, come from the Northwest, and just like Pastor Daniel said, he has just been a very close friend of mine now for several years. Although, that's not a really unique claim that I can make. I'm sure that uh, for all the people that you might have visiting, pastors you have visiting, there's a lot of people in this world that would call Pastor Daniel one of their very close friends. It's just kind of, you know, there's just those type of people, you know what I mean? Uh, he's the type of guy who probably has stood, I'm sure, for tons of people people at their wedding, you know what I mean? He's, uh, he's just an incredible man, not just father and husband and pastor, uh, but I get the privilege to know him as friend, and that's been really amazing, so it's really awesome to be with you, even though I don't know what it says about our friendship that he invited me to come here, and then he left to go away from here. <laughs> oh, well, I try to not, I just try to not take it personal. I'm just uh, working on my security. Uh, so I do, I come from Oregon. Now I've, uh, I've got a little bit more that I'm gonna share about that, but this is really cool to be with you guys. I came all the way out here to uh, West Texas, but then I get to uh, see uh, Pastor Ernie Kruger, who's out here, uh, who I get to share some seminary moments with out in the Philippines, and also uh, Pastor Herring, get to meet his wife Wendy as well, who's also been a part of our Every Nation Seminary, uh, which is where, that's my part-time gig, as I teach there. So I'm a part-time Bible nerd, that's what I do there. And uh, for any of you that are nerd, like very nervous, that you have like a professor in the room that's gonna teach you about the Bible, you should be, you should be very, very nervous. I could call on you or quiz you at any moment, this could happen. In fact, if I was a really, really cruel professor, I would call up Ernie. Since he took my class, he should be able to preach what I'm about to preach without any preparation or notice and knowing just how competitive Pastor Ernie is as well. That could be a fun moment, an opportunity. See what he'd come up with. Um, all right, so here's what we're gonna do this morning, you guys. Uh, I wanna first introduce you to my family. These are the humans that God has assigned to me. And uh, so that's my crew currently. That crew fluctuates relatively consistently. Uh, the four lighter hued uh, younger humans there are mine. If you, yeah, you're like, yeah, we get that. <laughs> we totally get that. Uh, so uh, I've got four kids. My oldest is 18, going to graduate high school here in just a, just, just a wee bit. Uh, and then I've got a 16-year-old, 14-year-old, and 10-year-old daughter there. That's my wife, Hannah. And then uh, to the left, that's, uh, that's Bum Joon. He's uh, our South Korean student. lived with us for a couple years now. He's actually in high school. And then that's, uh, that's Joel, Joel Walker. So Joel Walker was actually a, a soccer player at Oregon State University. I don't know if you guys believe in soccer here, if that's against your religion. Uh, but uh, neither did we, honestly. I played football at Oregon State, but then uh, all these soccer players started getting saved, and I guess, well, I guess, Lord, if you insist, I will like, care about soccer a little. So uh, he lived with us for, for a little while. He's actually married now, still living with us, but we're hoping he gets, no, I'm just joking. No, he's uh, living with his wife, doing great. Um, but our home has just always been filled with all kinds of people throughout the years. We've had uh, people from all over the, the Middle East and Asia and Europe, and it's been quite a fun ride uh, for us. So that's a little bit about what home looks like for me. What I'm excited to do here this morning is to talk about Jesus, and specifically to talk about his story. You know, there's a couple of ways that you get to know somebody. One way is by uh, introducing your name, which you guys heard from Pastor Daniel. Another way is to hear about someone's story. And what I just gave you guys was a brief blip into at least a small slice of my story in terms of my family, my context, my peoples, where I come from. But if you really want to get to know someone, that's typically where you start. What's your name? And then, yeah, explain to me all the narrative involving you. Now, if I were to do that for myself, I would start on a cold winter's day in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, uh, when a woman gave birth to like a nine pound, 10 ounce bouncing baby boy. Yes, I was a large one. And I was the first born son uh, to Pam and Walter. And I only lived in Nebraska for a couple years when the call came upon my parents to move out to Oregon. The irony being that Scotts Bluff, Nebraska is on the Oregon Trail. So our family literally took the Oregon Trail and moved to the most unchurched county in the United States. And from this place, I found Jesus. 
And in this place, I'm still seeing Jesus do miracles as he is transforming what is supposed to be an unchurched, unreachable, godless, pagan culture, although we have fantastic food trucks. <laughs> we lack the gospel. But I'm seeing Jesus do incredible things to multiply his people in that place and pouring out his presence in that place. And we've seen church plants come out of Corvallis, Oregon, to Seattle and Portland and Eugene. And we're seeing God continue to move and work in powerful ways. And though that's just a little bit of a slice of my story, you'll hear little bits and parts of me and where I've come from and what God has done in me. And from that, you will get to know me in a deeper level. And one of the beautiful things that God does for us is he gives us not just his name, but also his story. Now, whatever else you think that the Bible is, um, a very long meandering history of uh, peculiar uh, religious people, a um, very detailed law book of rules, regulations, and morals that we're specifically to follow, otherwise God gets mad or whether it's some theological dictionary for us. It's like, it's just a very large book filled with deep theological sort of intellectual concepts that you and I are meant to study in the ivory towers of academia in order to have the right ideas in our head about God. All, All of these variations of what we think that the Bible is fall short to the true beauty of all that is. It's not that the Bible doesn't contain morals or laws. It's not that the Bible doesn't introduce us to theological ideas. And it's certainly not that the Bible can't be a personal, devotional, meaningful experience that we encounter in our lives. But fundamentally, it's a story from beginning to its end telling us about the beauty and the wonder of the God that made us. It's his way of revealing himself to us. Now what's sad to me is that I spent a good chunk of my life, and maybe some of you have yours as well, believing things about the Bible that were far less than what it actually was. And so for me, even reading the Bible was a chore. Now I'm just going to assume I'm in a room of normal people, and so that for you, to some degree, it is as well. I still remember the first time I got saved when I was 20 years old. I was a sophomore at Oregon State University. And at my high school graduation, this four foot 10, bright red haired young Christian girl who I shared biology class with had the courage to hand me, proud atheist Seth, a Bible at graduation. It's one of the most awkward guests I'd ever received. It sat on my shelf collecting dust until the moment of my salvation. I pulled it off and said, well, this is convenient. And I did what every good person is supposed to do when you like read a book, you start at page one. And page one's pretty interesting. Don't know if you read page one of the Bible. It's pretty interesting. It's a a week, apparently, to describe billions of years and complexity and uh, and I'm reading it, wondering myself, and where where are the dinosaurs exactly? And then I read chapter two, and then up there's trees, fruit trees happening there. Uh, and I was doing okay until chapter three. And then there's a talking snake. And I just felt like, you know, I'm just, uh, I don't know exactly what's going on here. Uh, but I persevered because I love Jesus. And I, I just held on with a white knuckled grip. And I made it through Genesis, and my goodness, Genesis. The level of family dysfunction there. And I'm I'm still wondering to myself, are these supposed to be role models? Because I'm just, I'm not filled with awe and inspiration yet. I don't know when that moment is supposed to come, God, but uh, I'm not, it's not, it's just not happening for me yet. And then you read into Exodus, and I'm like, oh, this is a really cool story. Someone should make a movie out of this, (laughs) you know? Turns out they have a few times. That's great. But then that's the only first half of Exodus. And then the second half of Exodus, we're getting detailed plans of how to build a tent in the middle of the desert. And I'm wondering to myself, I am a college man with raging hormones trying to not look at porn and follow Jesus and figure out my life, but somehow God seems very intent for me to know how to build a tent in the desert. Not relevant to me. But I love Jesus, so I persevered. And I made it to the end of Exodus, my friends. And I flipped the page from Exodus. And my goodness, Leviticus. Have you ever read Leviticus? 
I said, Jesus, my love has hit a dead end. This is as far as it goes. Because I can't handle one more bodily fluid. <laughs> that is just, this is just enough for me. This just is, this just is enough. And if this is what the Bible is, I, I've, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this thing. And somehow there's enough guilt and obligatory compulsion in church to get most of us through it. But rarely do we ever enjoy it much less understand it. But one of the beautiful things about the Bible is that even though the cookies are not always on the bottom shelf, it is indeed an invitation to understand the story that God is unfolding on his terms, written in a context that was not specifically designed for your reading eyes, although it is meant for you to bless you and to help you know The God that made you, saved you, and will one day make all things new. So tonight, shameless plug, we're going to tell this whole story of the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Uh, We're going to do it in under two hours. And you are going to be able to not only see the grand story written over about 1,500 years in different languages, times, cultures, and places, See how it's woven together in a unified fashion. But you yourself will be able to retell that story to a friend at Starbucks on a napkin in under two minutes. The story, at least at a 30,000 foot level, is not that difficult to understand. Seeing the forest like laid out before you from a grand perspective helps to give context for all that's going on. And then you can spend the rest of your life diving down into the forest and examining all the individual trees, especially all the ones in Leviticus that give us you so much trouble. But I promise you, the beauty of it is incomparable. And more than that, the God revealed in that story is greater than you presently know. So it's with that in mind that I want to introduce us to that story, specifically through the eyes of Jesus. Because you have to imagine that when Jesus shows up and he's born into our world, there has to be something that frames his understanding of his identity and his calling. Clearly, he's got a pretty intimate relationship with his father. But shockingly, when you read about the life of Jesus, every time he speaks in a self identifying way, every time he's introducing himself or his ministry or his calling or his purpose, he's referencing constantly what we would call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, all the holy scriptures that he had up until that point, Jesus took and absorbed into himself and understood his own life and his own calling through them. And so when Jesus processes all that the Bible means, He does so not just in a very personal way, but he does it in the type of way that he insists is meant to help us know him. I want to show you exactly what this looks like. We're going to start in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And here's a beautiful moment that Jesus has. If I had to pick like my top three, top five fly in the wall history moments, this might be one. And you'll see why here in just a moment. If I could just go back, assuming I could understand Aramaic and just have a moment, this, this might be it. In Luke 24, um, Jesus has risen from the dead. He is fresh out of the grave, really fresh out of the grave. So fresh out of the grave that all of his followers have not quite caught on to the reality that he is indeed out of the grave. So in verse 1 it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, There was women that took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. There they found the stone rolled away, but when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, while they are wondering about this, as you do, like, hmm, I wonder, dead bodies, gone, what could that mean? Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them, and in their fright, the women bowed down to their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. So the women go run and tell this news to the men. Verse 13. Now that day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. 
two disciples of Jesus that had spent who knows how much of the three years of his ministry with them, probably a decent chunk of it, had been with Jesus in Jerusalem for the festival that led to ultimately his death. And as they are leaving Jerusalem, headed back to Emmaus, they have a seven mile walk ahead of them. Now, quick question here. How long does it take to walk seven miles? I notice every time I come to Texas, y'all don't walk much. (laughs) Just not a thing. Like you have highways and roads, but very few sidewalks. And heaven forbid you would ever have a bike lane anywhere. I am from Oregon where we worship bikes in the rain. (laughs) And we have sidewalks everywhere um, because we hate cars. I guess. But if you were to walk, let's just put on our imagination caps for a moment. How long would it take you to go seven miles? Now, what's funny is I ask this question, especially places where people don't walk. Some people are like, all day. <laughs> like, <laughs> seven miles? Oh, sh- I don't, I, all day long. Well, well, you know, you can walk at it like a three mile an hour pace. Uh, for a guy that's my height, that's not, that's not that much. But for sure, like, you know, two and a half, that's a, it's a leisurely little stroll. Now, given that the average male height 2,000 years ago in the Near East uh, was around five foot three, five foot four. That's how tall Jesus was, give or take an inch or two. Their gait might have been a little bit shorter than mine. I'm a full foot taller than them. But you know, we're looking at about three to four hours, likely. Three to four hours. That's a long walk, would you agree? Three to four hours, let's just keep that in the back of our heads. Now on this walk, they were talking with each other about everything that had just happened. And as they walked and discussed these things with each other, guess who shows up? Jesus does. And he walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Hmm, incognito Jesus. Uh, I picture this scene with Jesus wearing those glasses with like the mustache and fake nose kind of sort of. Like Clark Kent, Superman, can't tell me now. I don't know what, I I can't explain to you exactly what it was about Jesus that they couldn't recognize. But the resurrected Jesus is now walking with these two men on a three to four hour journey, and they don't even know who he is. Men who had walked with Jesus, been disciples of Jesus, now for some strange reason, after his resurrection, can't recognize him. Curious, curious. Let's keep reading. Jesus asked them a question. Hey, what are you guys talking about? They stood still. Their faces were downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, dude, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know what just happened here? The resurrected Jesus. What things? Now, I don't know, I don't know if you know Jesus that well, but do you have a category for this? Do you have a category of Jesus coming alongside his disciples who are traumatized and in despair. They saw their Messiah, their leader, brutally murdered, taken from them. It's only been three days. He was on a movement. He was riding a wave. And then it all came down to a sudden grinding halt. And Jesus says, hey, what you guys talking about? What do you think they're talking about? Coy, Jesus. Very coy. Does he have a sense of humor? In like really dark times also. I just, I don't know quite what my brain is supposed to do with that. But whoever you think Jesus is, he's way more interesting. I promise you that. 
What things? Hey, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find a body. They came and told us that they had seen vision of angels who said he was alive. Then... Some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just like the women had said. Now Jesus says to them, what do you expect Jesus to say now? How foolish and slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, Here's how I would expect the moment to go. What are you talking about? Jesus, he was just brutally murdered, but we've heard rumors of his resurrection, which they don't quite believe. I expect Jesus to be like, fellas, it's me. Like some bro hugs, you know what I mean? Fist bumps, high fives, you know what I mean? I don't know, something. He launches into them with a harsh rebuke. Can you imagine that? Could you imagine the level of deep sadness and despair? It's just like, what's wrong with you? How foolish you are. You're fools and so slow to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. Did not first the Messiah have to suffer and then enter his glory? And then what Jesus does is he begins with Moses and all the prophets and explains to them everything in the scriptures concerning himself. Now Moses is a shorthand way of describing the first five books of the Bible, what we would call the Torah or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses is the attributed author to those books. So saying Moses is a way of saying those are essentially his books. And the prophets begin in Joshua. In the Hebrew Bible, it's a shorthand way of describing essentially the rest of the Old Testament as we know it. So what Jesus does is he takes our Old Testament, begins in Genesis, goes all the way to Malachi, and he explains to them everything in it concerning himself. With the insistence of, if you actually knew your Bible, you would not only know me, but you would know exactly how my life was supposed to go. That death would lead to resurrection. That's been the plan all along. And because of that, you would have had resurrection faith. But because you don't have resurrection faith, because somehow my death interrupted every level of trust that you had in me, you missed the point. Because you didn't know the story. You don't know the story, then you missed who Jesus really was. And you missed the moment to trust what he was here to do. And watch this for a moment. Notice this. These disciples can't see Jesus, correct? They don't recognize him, correct? They can't recognize him, and they have this condition where they are doubting the resurrection. Somehow, not trusting in, not having resurrection faith, or faith in the resurrection of Jesus, produces some kind of spiritual blindness that incapacitates us from being able to recognize Jesus. And Jesus says, how foolish you are and slow to believe. All that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah first have to suffer? Isn't this how the story has always gone? The Apostle Paul said a similar thing in first, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He wrote to Timothy about what we would call the Old Testament. And he said this, that all scripture, it's inspired, it's God-breathed. And in particular, he says, you've learned these scriptures from a very early age. And all these scriptures are able to make you, in his words, wise for salvation through faith in Messiah Jesus. That the Apostle Paul, all the apostles, how did they think of what we would call our Old Testament? All that they were meant to do was to give you wisdom that you would be led to trust in Messiah Jesus. How many of you have picked up your Old Testament and thought that's exactly what God's doing in my heart right now? 
Is it possible that we've missed the point of God's story or just missed the story altogether? Is it possible that Jesus might take a walk with us like he did on the road to Emmaus and reintroduce us to the story about him, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, and how this was the plan of God to remake the good world that was falling apart. And once you dive into this story, you will see that this is a story from beginning to its end that has one cohesive storyline running through it. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth and everything that God made was good. If you read the very end of the Bible, it starts with a new heaven and a new earth and a renewal of the story of creation. So somewhere between in the beginning, God makes all things, and in the end, God makes all things new. Something had to happen in the middle that takes things out of the brokenness and death that humans introduced and raises them up once again to new life. And this is where the Gospels of Jesus all start. The Gospel of Mark says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus. Because in the beginning of Genesis, God made all things. In the beginning of the life of Jesus, he brings the good news that he's going to make all things new. And in the book of Revelation, that promise is fulfilled. It says there's no good work that God begins that he does not complete. How foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah first have to suffer, to join the world in its death, and to offer a way out through his resurrection? This is the story. And if this isn't the story that burns in your heart, if this isn't the story that becomes clear when you open your Bible, then may I please invite you to come join us on a um, proverbial walk to Emmaus as Jesus opens up Moses and the prophets to us and helps us to understand him and his purpose more fully. And I tell you, if we don't, and if this story doesn't get deep into our soul, there's something that we lose and we miss out on. Jesus didn't say, sorry, fellas, you just uh, you missed it by that much. He calls them fools. Jesus' expectation was that we would know his story. He expects us to. He expects us to pick up our Bible and to see his story throughout it. He expects us to pick up our Old Testament and to clearly know his story in it. He expects us to pick up the Torah and clearly know his story just through that. Or the book of Genesis and to see the story begin just there. Or maybe just the first half of Genesis. Or maybe just the first three chapters of Genesis. Or maybe if you were reading carefully, you could see it in just the first chapter of Genesis alone. And when we see God's story... <clears throat> Oh my goodness, does it liberate us from all the false ways that we might be tempted to live in this world. One of the huge ways I see people living in my context, and I'm sure there's many in yours as well, is that not only do they not know God's story, not only is that the thing that is not framing their reality, but they don't live according to any story. For many of my context, we just believe that we're random stardust, we came from nothing, we're headed to nothing, and it's just arbitrary that our existence is even a thing. I was listening to a, a famous uh, atheist scientist not long ago being asked about what was there at the beginning of the universe. And his answer was simply, there was some deeply complicated, mysterious, reproducible molecule to which the logical question that even a kindergartner could ask yeah, and where did that come from? And this ardent atheist says, we don't know. But he insisted, oh, but we can't know. Yeah, a very complicated machine with technology far beyond human comprehension or ability to design just appeared out of nowhere. And random chance, even given over billions of years, does not adequately describe the story that we've come from. You've come from nothing. You're meant for nothing. You're headed back to nothingness. And if we look at the anxiety and the depression in our world, I get it. 
And some of us think that we should be fighting for greater mental health and against depression. And, but you know what? If that's the story you're living in, can I just humbly say, depression is appropriate. That's a depressing story. You want us to just lie to you and tell you to be happy anyway or drug you up and just try to make you feel happier anyway? The truth is we were made for a better story than that. Now, for those that say like, no, 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 okay, I believe that there is a God and I believe that there is a grander story at play. But for some of us, we're not still living in the right story. We put ourselves as the main character in that story. And we've told ourselves all kinds of things like, well, there is a God who is all powerful and who made all things. And he made us as these like dirty kind of wormish sort of characters that fall far below his holiness and that our greatest life purpose is to glorify and to worship this God and exalt him with all that are being because if a God is all powerful but doesn't make essentially some sort of being to properly worship him, does it really count? And so we live in this story under the constant fear and guilt and shame of obligation and perpetually offering up praise and worship to a God hoping to appease him well enough that he doesn't mess too badly with you. It's the wrong story. Some of you are so frantically living according to fulfilling every possible moral code that you can imagine, living under the deep shame of every way in which you fall short and offering up even worship to God, not from a place of joyful, loving gratitude, but deep religious guilt. Wrong story. Some of you are living with the idea that you are the main character in your movie and that what life is all about is feeling happy and fulfilled and peaceful. And there is some land of joy and peace out there that you are a sojourner headed towards. And so in this level of story, if you have a God that is on your side that can help you and give to you what you say you need circumstantially at any given moment, if with the proper amount of self-care you can elevate your own level of personal feelings of well-being, then maybe you can satisfy your purpose. But I'm here to tell you, we live in a better story than that. We live in a story where a God of perfect love made you in love, by love, and for love to walk in deep relationship with him and partner with him in the ongoing creation of the world. And you and I betrayed that God, but God has sent his son to die in your place so that through him you could come out of your grave because Jesus went first. And your sin was so bad that God had to die for you, but God is so good that he was glad to die for you. And your happiness doesn't come because circumstances have all aligned or some mysterious emotional light switch has been turned on on the inside of you, but your happiness comes from knowing the most amazing God in the universe that intimately loves you and has poured himself out for you. And when you walk with him, when you walk with him, life can fall apart, all hell can break loose. But in him, there is abundant joy. And in him, there is transcendent peace. And in him, there's a purpose to which you've even been placed here and now. You have the right story, my friends. And you have something so contradictory to what the rest of the world has. And Jesus kindly calls us idiots and fools and slow to believe, but offers up this gracious presentation of how this story is not about us. It's been about him and his love for us and pursuit of us. And not just simply wanting to forgive you of your sin, but wanting to make everything about you new. Wanting to recreate a world in which you could enjoy him and be with him forever and ever, doing work that you could hardly know would satisfy you in this world, if you could even have it explained to you, your mind wouldn't be able to comprehend. This is the story in which we live. And when we live in this story, my friends, the resurrection faith that Jesus has called us to have, 
gets us through the pain and the suffering and the hardship. It gets us through the doubt and the questions. And it helps us to draw closer to the one that made us. So my hope this morning is that God has just planted a little seed in your heart that desires to know Jesus a little bit more. Not to increase your Bible knowledge, not to increase the amount of verses you understand, but that you might know him and that you would love him. And like those two men on the road to Emmaus, after seeing the resurrected Jesus for who he really was, you would be able to likewise say, were not our hearts burning within us? Is there not something that God has done in us? Is there not something in my life that desires him more, that loves him more? And my friends, no matter how good you believe Jesus is, I promise you, he's still better. And you will never get to the end of just how glorious and beautiful and loving and kind and gracious and wonderful he actually is. But tonight, you get a chance to at least take one step, one giant step forward in that direction. So Father in heaven, I'm asking, I'm asking, for all of us that are living in the wrong story, for all of us that are living for ourself, for all of us that are living for career, for all of us that just feel stuck in depression, for all of us that have just been lost in nihilism and feeling like this whole universe is pointless, for those of us that have been lost in worshiping and serving things that have not loved us back, I'm praying, Jesus, that you would come Resurrected Jesus, come. Come alongside us, walk with us, and help us to know you and your story. And Father, I pray that our hearts would start burning a little bit more for you. And Jesus, you would ignite a fire in us, a passion that would not be quenched. And Lord, I thank you for this, in Jesus' name, amen.